So in the meantime, people, uh, it is very important for us to understand uh, the basic concept of paragraph summary. And as you all know, that last year in CAT 2018, we had three questions from paragraph summary. That's a big number because three questions from paragraph summary. So I would put it as PS and you had four questions from odd sentence. So that is four from odd sentence. Sorry, uh, four from para, para jumbles. Four from para jumbles. And then you had three questions from odd sentence. So all the three taken together, there were 10 questions from verbal ability. So we never know, this year might, this year you might come across uh, more than two or three questions, more than three questions from paragraph summary. So it is very important that you keep an eye on verbal ability. And out of the 10 questions from verbal ability, if there is something that is really scoring, I think it is summary. Because summary has the options. So you can always, there are four summaries you can choose from four choice. Same goes with odd sentence as well. Even in even in odd sentences, you have the options, but you have five options because there are five odd sentences given to you. And out of those five odd sentences, you have to choose the one that is not fitting in the sequence, right? So in paragraph summary, you have four choices. So the odds of getting the answer right is 25%. In, uh, uh, in, in odd sentence, you have five sentences. So the odds of getting the right sentence as odd one is 20 percent and in parajumbles because the combination the right combination uh, uh, there are many right combinations that there are many right combinations possible so the issue with parajumbles is that it is difficult for you to strike the right answer immediately because you have to find the opening sentence after finding the opening sentence you have to find the next in sequence then the next in sequence right so out of the three chapters from uh, from verbal ability my first preference would be either odd sentence or paragraph summary, preferably paragraph summary, because it is very similar to the RCs. You can compare the options, you can check which option is better, how it looks. So paragraph summary is not better than uh, uh, the, the, the odd sentence because of option comparison. Odd sentence is better than paragraphs because there is only one option that could be the right answer. In, and at the end, I have paragraphs. So if there is something that I have to choose towards the end, that is basically the paragraphs. Okay. So, anyways, let's start. Let's look at the questions. And in today's session, I will be solving some questions that came in CAT 2017 and CAT 2018. Because the recent summary questions uh, are, are really difficult, not very difficult, they are good questions. And uh, if you look at what exactly summary is all about, it says it is a shortening and capturing of critical ideas. So if someone asks me, how do you summarize? Because people's summary as, as, as a method is going to be of great help even in uh, your uh, uh, the, the, the reading comprehension passages where you need to shorten the paragraph and create a central idea. So a summary to me is a shortening and capturing of critical ideas of the passage without distorting any piece of it. So when you are shortening, that is very important. But while shortening, you have to ensure that you capture the critical ideas. Because if you fail to capture the critical ideas, then I think you have missed on something. And that's why it's not going to be the right choice. Apart from that, there has to be no distortion. How to get access to the live, live session, I think. So to get access to the live sessions, yes, uh, there is a link that I have circulated at different. So Click on the like, click on the link, and I think you should, I think you should be able to enter the class. Take care. So this is what we mean by summary. And so the next slide says, what is a good summary? The first point says, a good summary does not miss critical information. So whenever you compare the options, A, B, C, D, you have to look at that which is not missing critical information. And option B says, does not distort information. It is equally important. Missing of information can be critical. If you miss critical information, then you are not on track. And secondly, if you distort information. Now, what do you mean by distortion of information? I will give you a very simple example. The passage says that diabetes is the biggest killer in India. And the option would say that diabetes is the biggest killer in Southeast Asia. So there is a difference between the two choices. When diabetes is the biggest killer in, in India, 
you cannot simply summarize by saying that diabetes is the biggest killer in Southeast Asia. I know one question in which in which said, so please cover the paradigms. I will come to that. Don't worry about it. Uh, I will. Uh, there's, a, there's a session on paradigms as well tomorrow. Okay, so just be patient. Let's let's focus on summary now. We will take a few questions and that will give you a fair idea. So there was a question uh, in CAT and the question said that the followers of the school of Sigmund Freud are making wrong statements. The, the paragraph said that the followers of the school of Sigmund Freud have made a wrong statement. The option said Sigmund Freud made a wrong statement. Now, I think these are two different things. When you say Karl Marx made a wrong statement, it is one thing. And the followers of the school of Marxism made a mistake. It's a different thing. So my point is, there are many ways in which in the reading comprehension and summary, the options are distorted. By distortion, I mean to say that X is given in the paragraph, but something different from X is given in the, uh, in the actual option. So you have to compare the option. And secondly, it says a good summary focuses on the right areas and brings out the right relationship. Now, what is this focusing on the right area? The passage speaks about something and the passage has maintained a focus on something. By focus, I mean to say the emphasis. Sometimes you miss on the emphasis. You give undue importance to something. This, is, this happens in RC. The author seems to be talking about agriculture sector and, you know, to, to explain the problems of agriculture sector, he has taken the example of sugarcane, how it is suffering as a cash crop. So what you have done, you have, you have taken the whole uh, passage as a passage that is focusing on sugarcane only. But sugarcane is just an example which the author is using to explain to you the bigger picture about the problems of agriculture. So one of the reasons why people miss on summary question is because they miss that what exactly is the passage focusing on. How to find the critical information, I will come to that later on when we take the question. The next slide that says is how to attempt summary questions in the exam. This is very important people because this is where you start creating the approach. When you say how to attempt summary questions, here are three points that are very, very important. And your complete process of elimination and finding the right answer must follow these three points. The first one says always compare the options. I think there is no better way. The biggest savior in the in, in the VAR section is your option. That's the reason why paradigms become so difficult because there is no option. And most of you, you know, make plenty of mistakes in that. So the problem with uh, with with with, uh, uh, with paradigms is no option. And the good thing with summary is that you have the option. So you can always compare the options. Ensure that the critical ideas in the options have the right kind of relationship. How that comes, I will take the question to draw. And secondly, if you have difficulty understanding the passage, this is, this is very important. Many people start fighting with the equation. If you have difficulty understanding the passage in the exam, then you can come back to it later on. This is something people you have to keep in mind because when you start, when you start with the question and you are grappling with the question, you're not having clear picture of what exactly it means. For a while, just forget about it and go to the next. Because if you spend too much time on a question, the chances are that you might miss on some of the other easier questions. You can always come back to a question once you have finished the entire thing. We can always say, I'm having difficulty. Let me just flag it. I will come to it. This strategy is very important. Why? Because as a result of this, you'll be able to reach all the questions and thereby pick the easy ones. This is very, very important. And let's look at how we are going to solve the questions. Now, here, uh, as you all see, I have collected the questions and I will straight away go to the questions that, that came in um, CAT 2017 because uh, that is the paper that was released. And as you all, can you all see this question, people? Is the question visible to you? A slight, I will, I will have to change uh, this here. I hope you all can read the passage. So just take the 12th question here. This question came in CAT 2017. And I will, many of you will get the right answer. 
But what we are going to learn here is how to use the options, how to compare the options, because this comparison would be of great help in finally. Okay, so uh, 12th question, people, just read this. Vibosha, if you have difficulty, just uh, take it from the mail. So, so let's let's have a look at this question and let's let's try to create a create a process. It says here the question says that North American walnut swings, moth caterpillars, look easy meals for birds, but they have a trick up their sleep. They produce whistles that sound like bird alarm calls, scaring potential predators away. Right? Just a moment. Okay. Scaring potential predators away. At first, scientists suspected birds were simply startled by the loud noise. But a new study suggests a more sophisticated mechanism. The caterpillar's whistle appears to mimic a bird alarm call, sending avian predators scrambling for cover. When pecked by a bird, the caterpillars whistle by compressing their bodies like an audio and forcing air out to specialized holes in their sides. The whistles are impressively loud. They have been measured at over 50 dB from 5 cm away, considering they are made by a 2 inch long insect. So when you read the passage, people, what, is, what are the words that frequently strike you? This is how we summarize. Many people have asked me sir, how to summarize the paragraphs of the RC. I told them when you read a paragraph, the first question you have to ask yourself is, what are the critical words that you came? What are the most frequently, uh, what nouns you most frequently came across in the 12th question? Can you tell me the nouns that you came across? People? When I read the paragraph, I realized that North American walnut swings is something that the author is talking about. Right or wrong, please tell me. When I read the passage, I realized that North American walnut sphinx is what the passage seems to be talking about. But what exactly is being talked about North American walnut sphinx? Is, is the author discussing their strategy to kill the prey, their physical characteristics? What exactly is the author discussing about North American walnut sphinx? So you will see, sir, he's discussing the alarm calls. Perfect. So the next word that comes in sequence is the alarm calls. So the author is discussing the alarm calls of North American walnut swings. Why do we have these alarm calls? Of course, they are loud. The author says the whistles are impressively loud. So the loudness of the whistle as the alarm call is what exactly is going on in the passage. So let's try to see what exactly are the options telling us. So option A says North American walnut swings, moth caterpillars, will whistle periodically to warn of predator birds. They have a specialized vocal track that help them whistle. So I have a few things. One thing, of course, is the, the sphinx, which has come. It says it whistles periodically to warn of predators, and they have specialized vocal track that helps them whistle. Okay, fine. Everything is good with this option. Let me go and take the next one. B says, North American water sphinx, moth caterpillars, can whistle very loudly. So now I see the difference between the choices, right? It says whistle periodically. It says whistle very loudly. The loudness of their whistles is shocking as they are very small insects. Everything looks fine. Even the shock part has been mentioned. The author says it's very surprising, right? So when I compare A with B, I realize that there are two things. One is, of course, warding of predators is given in option A. And the other is uh, periodically. So when I compare the option, is periodically relevant to the passage? So I will go and check to what an extent periodically is relevant to the passage. And I find that the, the author has not said periodically. The author has said loudly. So this becomes what? A distortion. So the point is when you look for the right things in the easy equation, you will come across the right things very quickly. So A goes out. B says North American wallet swings can be very loudly. The loudness is uh, shocking as they're very Perfect talk, no problem. There is nothing wrong actually with the option. Let's go to C. 
the North American water swings mock caterpillars in case of acoustic deception. Some people say that this acoustic deception is an extra element. We can check whether it is relevant or not. Produce whizzes that mimic bird alarm calls. So mimicking bird alarm calls to defend. Now this is very important. Mimicking bird alarm calls to defend themselves. So this defend point becomes something which is not there in the earlier option. And secondly, uh, the author has said acoustic deception. So now you can compare and check. Do we have acoustic deception? Or do we have the idea of defending themselves? And you will find that these both the words are relevant. The author has said, you know, that they want to scare potential predators away. That is basically, it's, it's a way of defending themselves. Secondly, the author says that uh, uh, they are uh, sending avian predators scrambling for cover. So if you, if, you, if you read the passage, then you find that the focus of the passage is not just the, 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 the caterpillar, the loud sound. In fact, the purpose behind the loud sound is to drive the predators away. There is defense mechanism that is coming into picture. So option C has that focus, which option B is not at. Everyone is clear about it, people. This is basically doing the analysis of the options. And thereby you will learn that sometimes you intuitively arrive at the right answer, and sometimes it becomes difficult. In that case, this kind of process would be of great help. Yes, everyone is clear about it, people. Option D says North American Wallet Sphinx in case of deception and camouflage. So this is where the options likely become distorted. The author has said, the author has said camouflage. He has said deception, but deception in, in voice, not in color. Camouflage is deception to physical characteristics, particularly color. So when I camouflage myself, I'm not actually uh, veiling my voice, I'm veiling my color. Are we clear about people? Everyone is clear with this question. Yes or no, please tell me. So this is the process, and I want all of you to to create this process while trying while solving the questions in the mock because you finish the mock you get it you get you get the question wrong why do you get it wrong two reasons either you did not understand what was given to you or you did not create you did not pay attention on the finer nuance between your and that is where you have to work on take the 14th question this too is a catch question it came catch when it came in catch when it's done. please try the 14th question So let's read it. Now, this is a typical, uh, people see, understand one of the biggest difficulties of, uh, of uh, reading comprehension, BARC, is that you will have difficulty understanding the passage. This is the first sign that, that the question is not very easy. So sometimes, uh, sometimes you read the passage, you find it difficult, but the options are easy. The point I'm trying to make is read. The, the, uh, the passage ones, come to the options, and just take a look at, at how, how different the options are from each other. Maybe the question could be very easy because the options are really very widely different, and that helps you to immediately arrive at the right answer. Let me read this for you, the 14th question. The 14th question says, a fundamental property of language is that it is slippery and messy and more liquid than solid. A gelatinous mass that changes shape to fit. So, what is the focus of the first sentence? The property of language, the author says, is slippery. It is more liquid than solid. So, he sets the tone of the character, saying that language is slippery and uh, it is something that keeps on changing. As Wittgenstein would remind us, usage has no sharp answer. Oftentimes, the only way to determine the meaning of a word is to examine how it is used. So, the author says language is, is liquid. And determine how, uh, how the meaning of the word, you must know how it is. This insight is often described as the meaning is used often. There are differences between the meaning is used and dictionary first theory of meaning. So there is something called as the meaning lies in the usage. And there is something called as dictionary first theory. And the author seems to be comparing the meaning is used with the dictionary first theory of meaning. The dictionary is careful fixing of words to different 
expressions like butterfly spin under glass can suggest that this is how language works. The definitions can seem to ensure and fix meaning of words. Just as gold standard can bag a country's currency. What Wittgenstein found in the circulation of ordinary language, however, was a free floating currency of so there is free floating currency of meaning rather than the fixing of the meanings. The value of each word arises out of the exchange. The lexicographer abstracts a meaning from that exchange, which is then set within the conventions of the dictionary definition. So when you read this passage, people see, let's let's try to let's imagine for a while that this question is not in summary, it can be asked. How would you summarize this, this, this particular paragraph? I realize immediately. That in this paragraph, the author seems to be talking about language and the fundamental property of language. He says that language or the words get their meaning from usage, not from dictionary. And towards the end, he says that uh, that the value of each word arises out of the action. And then he says the lexicographer. Lexicographer is to understand how to summarize so whenever you whenever you come across a word quite frequently that means the passage is actually discussing that word. and your summary must revolve around that same goes with the central idea of the passage. whenever you want to create a central idea it must revolve around the most frequently occurring word so in this 14th question the author seems to be telling us that language is not not fixed it is it is it is slippery and the meaning depends upon the way it is used. And he seems to be biased for that and not for the dictionary. He says, he says towards the end, the lexicographer abstracts meaning from the text, which is then set within the conventions of the dictionary. So the lexicographer gets meaning out of uh, uh, the uh, out of the usage. So you get the usage first, and then you get the meaning in the dictionary, not vice versa. Which option is the, is the best, if you look at it that way? Of course, many of you would say C is the right choice, which of course default become the right choice. Meaning is dynamic, definitions are static. So both the critical points have been, has been juxtaposed by the author very nicely. The meaning in use theory helps us understand the definition of words are curled means obtained from their meaning in exchange and use and not vice versa. So C becomes automatically the right choice. Now let's try to find flaws in A, B, and C. Yasmin has given B as the answer. B says language is already slippery, no problem with that. Given this, accounting for meaning in use will only exasperate the problem. Now the issue is, the issue is exasperating the problem. What exactly is exasperating? Did you understand this? It says accounting for meaning in use will only worsen the problem, but it is solving the problem. In fact, the author seems to be in favor of meaning in use. So if the author is in favor of meaning in use, then how is it going to exasperate the problem? It is. It, it should basically support the problem, uh, solve the problem, if the author is talking about it favorably. Did you see this? And this is what happens in the RC system, a direct, relationship has been totally upturned in the option and you must have you should have actually observed this that the author seems to be speaking favorably about the meaning in use so it is not going to exasperate the problem someone may actually ask me is it clear to you so b is not the right choice b is exactly opposite of what the author says the mean the meaning of words is, is clear fixed is not clear and fixed and less dangerous than the meaning that arises now the problem is what is wrong with A? Many people are not able to eliminate A. They might mark C as the right choice, that's fine. But what is wrong with A? What exactly? So many a time you would say C is better than A. Why? Because C is more complete, no doubt about it. That's why C is the right choice. But there is something specifically wrong with A. Yes, A says dictionary definitions are like goals and artificial theoretical dogmatic. Who said they're artificial? They might be theoretical. But who said that they are dogmatic? This is where, yes, this is where the, uh, what we call distortion. The author has said it's static and you have said it's dogmatic. Now there's a huge difference between static and dogmatic. Because according to me, 
static means fixed dogmatic means deliberately unwilling to change so the static is not static is not equal to dogmatic and this is what is going to happen in the rc the, the author would say that something is static and in the option you he would put the word dogmatic and you would think that dogmatic is equal to static are we clear about it people i hope you realize why he goes out it's a good question read it many of you would have difficulty understanding this language and sometimes when you have difficulty understanding something the best thing is to leave it for a while come back to it later or else you can keep on persistently you know reading it for example i would read this now what exact how do i mean it's easier said than done when people like us say that you know i understand it i have gone through it at least 15 times that's why i have a better understanding but in the exam you don't have the luxury of going through a paragraph at least once so the best thing is if you have difficulty reading it the very first time try once again and you, again if you are having difficulty just go to the next question come back to it later because the more you you get this oriented in the exam the more disturbed you would become and the less likely you would be to mark the right answer in that case so look at this routine question it says to me a classic means precisely the opposite of what my predecessors understood so the author says that classic is something my opinion of classic is something different from what my predecessors thought a work is classical by reason of its resistance to contemporaneity and supposed universality by reason of its capacity to indicate human particularity and difference in that did you want did you understand this sentence starting from this to this How many of you understood this? A work is classic by reason of its resistance to contemporary. I don't know. And suppose universality. So let's not fight. Let's go to the next sentence. Maybe I might get a better idea of what exactly the author trying to say. He says the classic is not what tells me about shared humanity. So here I have better understanding. The author says. classic is not what tells me about shared humanity or more truthfully put what lets me recognize myself as already present in the past what nourishes in me the illusion that everything has been like me and has affected me only to prepare the way for me difficult the only thing i understood is that classic is not what tells me about shared humanity instead the classic is what gives me access to radically different forms of human consciousness for any given generation of readers and thereby expands for them the range of possibilities of what it means to be a human being yes i mean you have to read and you have to check what exactly i understood the author says that classic is not about shared humanity it is about radically different forms of human consciousness ye mujhe clear ho gaya that it is not about shared humanity it is about radically different forms of human consciousness so this that means to to the author a classic is something that that brings to him different forms of consciousness ab hum ek ko dekhte hain a classic is about what so the 15th question the author seems to be focusing on what exactly classic means to him to the author classic is what something that gives him access to radically different forms of human ye mere ko samajh mein aaya So I will try to fix the option depending on this. A, A says a classic is able to focus on the contemporary human condition and a unified experience. If it is focusing on unified experience, then how can you say that it is a radically different form of human consciousness? So A to pakka nahi hoga na. Clear with these people because A says that it is unified experience, but the author says he wants a radical experience. So radical ka matlab kya ho jayega? Different. and different is not unified i hope you understand this why a goes out radically different means not unified not common uncommon samajh mein aa raha hai ki nahi yes or no so this is the this is what i always tell people you try to create your house of understanding with whatever you can pick from the fact jo samajh mein nahi aa raha chhodo usko jo samajh mein aa raha hai usko pakad ke dekhenge kya hota hai B says a classical work seeks to resist particularity and temporal differences, even as it focuses on common humanity. But it is not the focus. The author says a classic is something that is not focusing on common humanity. Again, option B has gone wrong 
the same way often A has gone wrong. A says unified experience, B says even as it focuses on common humanity. Only option C is doing the job. Look at how it does. A classic is the work exploring the new. New ka matlab kya? Different ho gaya na? Going beyond the universe. Going beyond the universe ka matlab kya hota hai? That means radically different. Going beyond the universe and beyond the contemporary and the notion of unified age. But the going beyond all these things, that is what classic is. That means see precisely fits what is given in the paragraph. Absolutely the way it should be. Radically different, new, you know, going beyond the universal, and precisely it is what C has to say. A classic is work exploring the new, going beyond the universal, the contemporary, and the notion of unified age. D says a classic is a work that provides universe. Again, the same problem. If something is new universe, it is common. We say that death is universal. It's there everywhere. So how can then it be radically different? So even D goes out. So what is the best choice people often see? Did you understand these people? This is a difficult question. See, on the day of the examination, you might get it wrong. But the point is getting it wrong within two minutes is fine. Getting it wrong within seven minutes or five minutes is bad. That is where most of you suffer. You get the question incorrect. This is what you have to understand. This is what strategy is all about. People, there are 34 questions. Radical means, uh, you know, radically different means totally different. Uska matlab radical ka wo hota hai. Radical changes nahi hota hai kai baar. Media mein aapne padha hoga radicalization is happening. So radicalization matlab kya hota hai? Fundamentally changing. Clear with these people? So now you are getting how exactly. Because kai baar kya hota hai? People understand. 34 questions exam mein aayenge. Would you get all 34 correct? Highly, highly unlikely. So if you if you will get correct, the chances of getting the easy and moderate questions correct are very high. But to pick the easy and the moderate, you must see all the 34 questions. If I want to I want to identify the easy questions. And to do that, I must see all the 34 questions. So when you are seeing all 34 questions, this is the kind of question that you say, let me come to it later on. Because the more the time you waste on difficult things, the more persuasive D wrong. D is wrong because it says a classic is a work that provides access to universal experience. But this is what the author is opposing. Author, author kya bolta hai? Instead, so if you read it, it's given here, right? It says, to me, a classic means precisely the opposite of what my predecessor understood. So what is given in option B is. Uh, is what the predecessor understood. Option B is talking about the predecessor's definition of a classic. The author has a different definition of a classic. He says a classic is something that is radically different. It gives access to radically different forms of human That's why D is wrong. Because the author says at, at the start, to me, a classic means precisely the opposite of what my predecessors understood. A work is classical by the reason of its resistance to contemporary. And suppose, so agar wo classic hai, iska wo kya kar raha hai? it is resisting what? Universality. If it is a classic, it is resisting universality. It means what? It is not universal, it is completely different. How D goes out. Many people wonder why should we do difficult questions. We do difficult questions so that if we come across these, we can leave them in the examination. Shall I go to the next question, people? Again, CAT 2017, 16th, please. Of course, see, when you read only the last three lines, See, people, you have to be smart. Some people simply compare the option. All the options say that, you know, classic is something which is universal. So the odd one out comes out, yes, see, okay, but then any classic wo hota jo universal nahi hota. So there are many ways of arriving at the right answer. 
but I would say the safest way is the correct way. Because that will ensure, that will guarantee you get the question correct. Shortcut techniques, you know, you have answer, okay, it, it you might, might work once or twice, but then because the process is flawed, it will definitely backfire at some point of time. Fifteenth question, please take sixteenth question. The people have given answer as D and then D C as well. So we have many answers. Last one has given D, C has given C, R S has given D, so some people also give A as D as the answer. So let's read it and let's try to understand what exactly it is. The question says a translator. It says a translator of literary works needs a secure hold upon the two languages involved, supported by a good measure of familiarity with the two cultures. So the author introduces the broad picture. He says, a translator of literary work needs a secure hold upon the two languages. And it should be supported by what? A, a, a good measure of familiarity with two cultures. For an Indian translating works in an Indian language into English, finding satisfactory equivalence in the generalized Western culture of practices and symbols in the original would be less difficult than gaining fluent control of contemporary English. Did you understand the sentence, people? From the second sentence, for the later English, did you understand this? So from this point, for an Indian translating works in an Indian language into English, finding satisfactory equal balance in a generalized Western culture of practices and symbols. So he says for an Indian who is translating the Indian work into language, sorry, Indian uh, work from an Indian language into English, finding satisfactory equivalent in a Western culture of practice. Is going to be less difficult than gaining fluent control of English. But the gaining control of English is, is going to be more difficult for an Indian. What is going to be what is going to be less difficult? Finding satisfactory equivalent. And then he says when a Westerner works on text in Indian languages, the interpretation of the cultural elements will be a major challenge rather than control over the grammar. That means for an Indian, interpretation of cultural language aspect is going to be easy. But language fluency is going to be a challenge. For a Westerner, the cultural aspect is going to be a difficult thing, but the language fluency is going to be an easier thing. This is, this is what he's trying to communicate. Are we clear about it, people, so far? Then he says, it is much easier to remedy lapses in language. Now, this is very important. He says it is easy to remedy lapses in language in a translated English than flaws of content. So what is flaws of content here? Lapses of language can be corrected. That means language ka part will problem nahi hai. So flaws of content kya hai exactly? The cultural aspect, right or wrong? Isn't it? That means the flaws of content is arising from the cultural misunderstanding. Since it is easier for an Indian to learn the English language than it is for a Briton or American to comprehend Indian culture, translations of Indian texts is better left to Indians. So the author says that translation of Indian text is better left for Indians. Why? Because they have better understanding and appreciation of the Indian culture. And therefore, they would be in a better position to, 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 to do justice to the content. That means the author says translation should be done by, by, by those who have better understanding of the culture than by those who have good command of the culture. Right? So let's look at the options now. While translating the Indian and the Westerner face the same challenge. Easy option to go out, yes or no? Are they facing the same challenges, people? <clears throat> they are not facing the same challenges, right? So can I say A goes out? B says, as preserving cultural meanings is the essence of literary translation. India's knowledge of the local culture outweighs the initial disadvantage of lower fluency. Who said that? Nothing wrong with B. He says, but then there is something which is extra. He says, preserving cultural meaning is the essence of. The author has said that you have to, man, I mean, 
the one who is translating should know the language and the culture culture a uh, distortion in cultural aspect cannot be easily overcome but he has no way said that preserving cultural meaning is the essence of the you might infer because the author is giving the author is not saying that the preserving the culture meaning is the essence that might be an inference but still i can hold the option for a while we go pakad ke chalta hu let's come to see indian translators to translate indian text is it given yes indeed it is given it comes as a conclusion of the paragraph look to look towards the end it says here since it is easier for an indian to learn the english language a uh, translation of indian text is better left to indians so can i say that the first part of c is doing a good job indian translators should translate indian text into english why because their work is less likely to pose cultural problem content wala problem cultural problem and which are harder to address that's the reason why the author says that you know in their translate then the quality of language because this this is not hard to address so can i just see is very much in the in 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 very much in the right direction these is westerners might be good at giving reasonable fluency to in in new language is it about new language is it about english language if you this is where i said this at the start that distortion is very very common the paragraph say that indian language into english and what have you done in option d you have said westerners might be good at giving a reasonable fluency in new languages not just english any new language how can you say that that means indians are better in understanding culture any culture it might be westerners are good at understanding languages any language it might be no Indians are good at understanding Indian culture, and Westerners are not. I mean, Westerners are good with the English language, but may not be with the culture, Indian culture. Can I say D is distorting, and therefore D has to go up? Yes or no? So you are left with two choices: B or C. C is better. समझ में आया कि नहीं? So I can mention at the start, बहुत distortion होता है. People see sometimes. Sometimes, you know, when you practice, when you are analyzing your thoughts, you will gradually get used to it. People don't be disappointed by your thoughts. I'm again telling you, you have to keep on. I have seen people getting 60, 65 percentile in the mocks in the verbal section. They end up getting 94, 95 in the exam. There is no need for you to worry much. The mock is not contemporary. का मतलब क्या है? Present, yes. Present means जो अभी का English contemporary English है. Shakespeare's English was not contemporary English. It was B B says uh, as preserving cultural meanings is the yes तो B सही नहीं है ना. B is not the right choice. Why? Because preserving the cultural meanings is nowhere given. That is not the essence. The author has not said what is the essence of X. He says that a translator of works needs two things. One is language. ठीक है शेल यू टेक वन मोर क्वेश्चन सो लेट्स टेक द लास्ट फाइव बिकॉज यू कैन सी अंडरस्टैंड यस प्लीज शूट योर क्वेरीज नाउ बिकॉज लेट्स लेट्स एंड द सेशन बिकॉज दिस वाज जस्ट अप कोर्स आई विल टेक इट लेटर ऑन जनरल क्वेरीज पीपल Bill says he is getting around seventy seven. R C is a big seventy seven percentile, right? See, I will give you my strategy. What I feel is the best. Whenever I start the paper, whenever you start the paper, you have to get a fair hold of what exactly is the passage from the paper comprises. So, at the initial stages, don't try to attempt something which is heavy. 
heavy in the sense difficult to understand. That means you start with philosophical concepts. You start with data that it's not a good idea. I would want you to start with something like you know the summary poetry, the odd sentence poetry, or maybe with an maybe start but with an RC whose subject you like. I would love to read something with which I'm comfortable. So if you want to start your verbal section, you start with that RC or that kind of question, which is less heavy. Ab less heavy ka matlab kya hota hai? To me, less heavy basically means something which I don't have to, you know, put lots of effort to understand. The heavier things I can take later on. So for me, the best thing would be to start with uh, an easy RC, something which I can read it. Quickly, so I can look at the question. So initially, when you start with your paper, you just scan everything. Quickly run through the RC. Say, RC, what is about this? Time division, 20 minutes to 20 minutes to VA and uh, uh, 40 minutes to RC, provided you have finished all 24 questions in 40 minutes. Agar nahi hua hai, to, you know, in between, you can always come to and have a look here, VA me kya aya. For example, I started with the paper. I did not like the first RC. I will not take it. But second pe gaya, I like the passage, so let me take the passage. Okay, I liked it. I saw the questions which I thought I could manage. Then I went to the third RC. I liked it. I went to the fourth RC. I liked it. I liked it. Fifth, I went, I did not like it. So I thought, okay, let me pass it for a while. I went and had a look at the summary. I thought, I can do this. Elimination will take time. See, people understand. The point I'm trying to make is, average out everything. If you are taking time to eliminate if you are taking time to eliminate options of one question definitely there would be a question in which you have taken less time so you don't go by time per question you should basically focus on the averaging out because there might be a difficult or moderate question which you take time kya karo gaya? there would be a difficult question right ya fir usko chhod do ki bhai ha theek hai i have given one one and a half minute i am not getting much out of it let me go and you know take the next People, all these kind of, you know, possibilities would have tried the exam. That's why it is very, very important that you don't waste much time in carefully reading the passage. Because what is going to fetch you marks is the option elimination. So I will, I will deal with the paradigms tomorrow. Don't worry about it. Today I am going to talk about overall strategy. The overall strategy right at the start has to be let me get the accuracy. Apne paas abhi you have the entire August, September, October, almost you have the whole of November. Every time I get, it's all right. I mean, I will come to that later on. Tomorrow again, we are moving. So, if you want a strategy from my end, I would say the strategy has to be that less focus has to be given to the fact. I might read this 10 times, but if I'm not good with elimination, I would never be able to get the marks. RC's target pura karo. Try to solve all the RCs. But if you have difficulty understanding, I mean, if you say, sir, one RC, I don't understand at all, leave it, go and take a few summary questions. If you have two RCs which you don't understand, go and take one odd sentence, two, three odd sentence questions. So, see, people, you have to reach everything. And that is possible only if you give more time to the question and less time to the passage. If you take seven minutes to read the passage, it's unfair amount of time that you have given to it. Disproportionate. You can't give seven minutes to read the passage.